Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Airgun World podcast, brought to you in association with Crackshot, the Southwest's premier airgun centre and ranges. I'm Matt Manning, and with me this evening, I've got my co host, Rich Saunders, and Gordon Blakeman from the Airgun Factory Facebook group. Now, getting into it quickly, shameless plug, latest issue of Airgun World magazine. You'd do well to miss that on the newsstand. Um, certainly eye catching. Rich, you have a group test in this one, uh, gas ram air guns. Like me, I think you do the majority of your shooting with recoilers yeah. PCPs. What's it been like getting out with uh, recoiling air guns? It's amazing how much you kind of forget that not so long ago, everything was springers and gas rams. And, you know, shooting a gas ram now is almost like relearning the whole air gun thing once again. I think that there seems to be a huge gulf between you know, very, very good gas rams and very, very cheap gas rams that aren't as good. And there's very little kind of in the middle. But we found a few, I think, um, in the feature, which offer that sort of good value for money. And they are pretty good to shoot as well. And I actually like shooting because, you know, there's, there's no spring clanging around and all that kind of stuff. And they, they definitely require a technique. But, you know, once learned, and I'm not saying that I learned it, but, you know, once learned, it, they're very rewarding to shoot. Yeah, and obviously gas rams require absolute minimal maintenance as well, don't they? They're, they're, they give a lot yeah. of service. I've got a couple of, of old uh, Theobans, and they've been knocking around for years and years and years, and they can be in the cupboard for months and months, a year at a time. Get them out, and they're exactly where they were when I put them away. Mm. Very low maintenance. Yeah. That's uh, it's, it, it's a good, they're sort of ever, ever ready for action. Gordon, do you do much um, shooting with spring gas ram recoiling air guns? Not anymore, but I must say I have, which is in my opinion, the most beautiful underlever that was ever made. I've got a Walther LGU um, that I get out every now and then, um, and it's right. just an absolute joy to use. Yeah, absolute yeah, yeah. Joy. So I think we can I, I easily think... forget the joy of shooting a recoiling air gun or, or it's it's not as straightforward and i think we had this conversation a while back didn't we rich about getting youngsters into shooting and what guns to, to start them off with and it's mm. it's not the instant gratification in terms of accuracy but there's more going on it's you can make more mistakes you've got to think much more about your technique um funny enough i've for the next uh issue of air gun world i've been reviewing the virac hw 97 kt fact have a sneaky mm -hmm. pick. This is a beautiful, beautiful underlever air rifle. Uh, yeah, just a really nice gun, and I've had a terrific time shooting it. But in all honesty, I've not been able to do it full justice. I, I can tell it's got that sort of PCP rivaling precision, super smooth, fixed bar barrel accuracy. But as somebody that doesn't shoot recoiling air guns enough, I, I can't. I can't really do it the justice. That, um, that I should, really. Um, other shooting that, that we've all been doing over the past week or two, Rich, what, what have you been up to shooting-wise? You know, I, I've had a really interesting week. I've, I've been out the last couple of nights shooting uh, hundreds of feral pigeons um, off of a couple of... One, one is a, uh, like a Victorian um, kind of country home that's a, like an arts and community centre. Really, really ornate place. Uh, and the other one is a 15th century um, Tudor mansion, which is now a very, very swanky hotel. And obviously you have to be sensitive to the fact that, especially in the hotel, there are people staying there and wandering around with the rifles, you know, can be raise a few pulses. Yeah. So I've been there early hours of the morning, um, loads and loads of pigeons there. And um, I have to be so careful because there are, Panes of glass windows, uh, stained glass windows that date back hundreds of years, and they're, you know, they're sort of historical artifacts. Apparently, this this place used to be frequented by Henry VIII. So, you know, the thought of putting a pellet through a, you know, one of those windows isn't good. And even that the slates on the roof are hundreds of years old, and they're slate and very very brittle. So, you know, great because you know, lots of pigeons to shoot and performing a real good pest control job, but quite frustrating because there's so many pigeons that I could see that I just couldn't take shots at. Mm. Um, so that, that's what I've been doing the last couple of nights. And then when we finish tonight, I'm going to be going out, hopefully getting a few rabbits um, for the next uh, air gun show. 
Oh, good stuff. Best of luck with that. Gordon, yeah, what, have, what have you been yeah. up to the last, past week or two? Been, been actually doing some shooting? Uh, yeah, I've been um, onto a couple of my perms. Uh, the, the one is over on with rabbits and they have horses. Um, so I've been, I've took my wolf rain over there, which I put the Pard DS35 on top. Mm. I, ju- I just absolutely love it. Um, and within 10 minutes I landed, I, I, I bagged a couple of rabbits. But if I'm not there, I'll, I'll just pop up to my uh, with the local range day, our leisure, and just pop along there. Mm-hmm. Just, um, but I'll probably get to shoot back four times a week. Um, right, oh, so g- good girl. Or I'm always tinkering. I've been in the woods all day today, getting battered by the wind. Uh, you can probably say I'm still looking pretty pretty pink from it. It was a blustery day, uh, so I've been on the squirrels today, um, and that that went pretty well. And a couple of nights ago, I was out on a really interesting rat shooting uh, outing in in a garden. It was quite a large garden, but. They've got a river flowing uh, quite nearby, and this is something Rich and I have spoken about a few times recently. The rivers have been running so high so frequently this winter mm. that a lot of rats seem to have been displaced from the riverbanks. They're moving up into higher ground, and that's exactly what has happened in this garden. They've obviously now found food and shelter, and they like it there. They've settled in. Um, so, again, like, like you found with your ferals in, in an unusual uh, scenario, there are just different things to have to think about with regard to where you're shooting um what's behind where you're shooting where the na- where the neighbors are do the neighbors need to know that you're out there lurking around uh, so it's been really interesting and, and another thing that's been interesting with that and i've, I've mentioned this on the air gun show recently and funny enough i don't want to keep plugging it but uh, in the latest issue of air gun world and that's using um liquidized bread for bait for rats now for years, I've been on about using actual wet liquid baits because they're terrific and rats have to stop to lap them up. And, and that's great. And I do think that it will be hard to ever find, in my opinion, anything better probably than liquidized cat food. But for a quick, clean, cheap rat bait, making breadcrumbs in the food processor, making them as fine as I can so rats can't pick chunks up and run off, mm. it's been terrific. And the most unusual thing about it is everyone says, oh, rats are neophobic. They hate anything new. They fear anything new. And that is, that is true, and it's typical of most wild animals, actually. But with bread, the rats seem to be on it. I literally put it out, go back to the car and load a magazine, come back, and they are on this stuff and loving it. And it's, it's not just particular to this permission. It's happened on the farm as well. So I'm, I'm quite liking this cheap, clean bait at the moment. <laughs> I've, I've had a lot of luck with, um, with barbecue sauce. Right. Because it's, you know, it's easy to keep in the truck. Apart from when the top comes off, that's not so pleasant. But, you know, give a squirt somewhere. And like you said, they can't run away with it, and it's nice and smelly. And if the farm cats or dog comes around the next morning and eats it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I should have to give bread a try as well. Yeah, no, I, I was surprised how good it was. And I sort of came onto it as an angler. And, you know, I do, I do, a, lot of, do a lot of course yeah. fishing. I love fishing for roach using liquidized bread and bread punch. And I usually don't put the crusts in the bread that I'm liquidizing for roach fishing. So it's like, what can I do with the crusts? So I've blitzed them up, taken them out ratting, and it's like, great. So now I've got cheap bait for fishing and cheap bait for shooting. Jobs are good. And that's what I've been up to. Gordon, the, the sort of the, the nub of, of why you are here, uh, the air gun factory. Can you tell us yeah. a bit about it as, as from when it began, how it began, what it's grown into? Well, it began, um, I mean, you, you and Richard know, Matt, but obviously listeners don't. I'm quite poorly. Um, and while I was in critical care, um, it was going through my mind because, they, you know, they didn't know if I was going left or right, as it were. And I started thinking, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. And Andy's group, which I used to frequent uh, as well, mm-hmm. had just been closed down. So I thought... We really need a group, we need a community, and I want to bring the young shooters through uh, and get, you know, new shooters just feeling safe, where they're not going to get trolled, etc. And then through watching you guys, since you've been around, uh, as you know, I approached you two and said, please, we'll be an ambassador on the group, uh, which we absolutely love having you guys there, you know. And I just... 
I just wanted to get everyone together in a safe environment. And But what I hear and what is most satisfying to me is there are so many friendships that have been forged through Airgun Factory, and mm. it is absolutely, you know, wonderful. I get to speak to a lot of RFDs. Um, they help, we, we, you know, because we have a free giveaway every month. Yeah, funnily enough, I was talking to a wife about it the other day, uh, and she said to me, is it where you wanted it to be? And I said, oh, my God, yes, and, like, 10 million times more, you know. The only problem we've got is that stupid, stupid algorithm on Facebook. That's the only thing that's causing us hassle. But, you know, we're trying to we're trying to keep it in. But we've got stuff in the background that, if any, God forbid anything happens, we can take on. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I just love it. I, I, just love, I just love guns. I love seeing people's guns. People mm -hmm. come to me for a lot of advice. My number two, Stephen Sawyer. He's an uh, ex-British Army sniper, uh, so he knows his onions, really. We've got Brian Young, who's an old trigger as well, and we've got Gareth, who've been shooting for years. And at this minute, it's it's the the best team we've ever had, you know. Such wood. He, he, he's really doing well. And, and how, how many members are you up to now, Gordon? Is it just shy of 5,000 now? But we have, awesome. Yeah, but we have kicked so many out who were breaking the rules or uh, who were trying to join. We've always been quality over quantity. You guys are there, you know, within our group. And we anything we do, do we don't want to besmirch, you know, you guys because your names are tied to us. Um, and that, you know, that's what, you know, it's all about shooting. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, so it is worldwide. We've got some crazy countries on there. It makes you realise just how truly global the sport is, and yeah. regardless of what country we're in or what language we speak, we all share a common passion for the same thing. And I think that's the important thing about what Airgun Factory is doing. It's that community. It's that looking out for each other and having yeah. having your members know that they don't need to be embarrassed to ask what they might think is a stupid question. Because I always say it was only a stupid question if you were too stupid to ask it, because quite frankly, you exactly. can only learn through asking questions. Um, and it, it is a sad fact, I think, on a lot of social media that there's a handful of people, and they're only a small handful, but they tend to be a noisy small handful, who are under this illusion yeah. that they can make themselves look better by making other people look worse. Yeah. And I, I couldn't sort of disagree with that more. And I think the fact that you mm. have created this place where everybody's equal, everybody's there to help each other to help other other members progress their shooting and enjoy more get more out of it i, I think that's fantastic so g going forwards if you have you got a specific game plan for for, for where air gun factory is going or do you just kind of take it one day at a time you know we we talk uh, as admins and um obviously i talk to you and richard and andy and etc our main goal and this might just sound mad we it's weird, especially without your lot being. I said to the wife, God forbid anything happens, I want to leave something. I want to leave something that people, you know, can enjoy and learn from uh, and a happy mm -hmm. place for them. And we really just want a shooting happy community. You know, if anyone's got any troubles because we do help a lot of people with their personal life out of air gun factory that's another thing that we do yeah mm. I've, I've heard so much really about the, the, the friendships and and the support that, that people have got out of it now obviously we've got the british shooting show coming up so talking about that sign that sort of community i know a lot of us are excited about you know, heading along there and catching up with people i i imagine it's a bit of a catch-up for quite a few of your members and i guess you're going too yeah, I'll be going on the Friday because health-wise, I can't make the two or three days. Um, I, I don't wish to say uh, say health will help, you know, and make me like you know, feel sorry for me. It's not that. It's just that I have to stress, I have to say that because people say to me, "Why don't you go in the three days?" And in the end, I have to yeah. say, "Look, I can't because health-wise." Um, yeah. So I'll be going the one day. Steve and Brian, I think, will be going the, the the whole three days. But we will be having a meet. We've yet to decide a meetup point. Um. But, you know, the amount of messages I get that, uh, you know, people struggling or worrying about the shooting in the background, and it, it, it's just, it means wonderful to be helping people, you know. Yeah. But 
you know, and I'll, I've got to admit, guys, be, before I go, it, it, it's Egon Factory is not where it is today without – it's down to you guys as well that we are where we are. It's down to, you know, our ambassadors, you know, where we are today. It's not all to do with me and all to do with Steve or whatever. You know, it's you guys as well who have put us on the map and we cannot thank you enough for it. We can't, honestly. Well, yeah, I, I think you know, th th thanks for having us. And, and you know, it's your, your hard work, it's your baby and also every single member yeah. because without all of them, that there would be nothing, would there? Back to the British shooting show. Rich, anything that you're particularly excited about? I am going to be there for the for the three days, and I have not learned my lesson because, you know, as, as you guys know, it is absolutely grueling to be there on your feet on a stand for three days. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to catching up with you know all the usual faces that you don't get to speak to or you don't get to see often enough. You speak to all the time, um, and I just love people who come up and say, "Oh, I saw you on YouTube, read your thing in the magazine," and just catching up with those people and. and you know, and it's wonderful for me that, you know, you can not know someone but share a, a passion for a certain sport and within 30 seconds you're talking like your two mates who met, you know, you used to go to school with or something. You know, so that's what I'm really looking forward to. Uh, Product-wise, I'm looking forward to, to getting around some of the new uh, night vision stuff. There's, you know, that, that thing, that monster just keeps to seem to keep developing new nv products coming out all the time new players and everything um so i'm looking forward to to seeing some of those um and um yeah having a pint or two as well <laughs> yeah i mean be, uh, it, it's, it's always nice to catch up catch up with makes for a pint and i'm sure we'll, we'll be doing that but but for me also yeah. meeting people that sort of watch what we're doing on youtube read what we're doing in air gun world and i i like to although it's lovely when when you get the ones that say oh i like this and i like that i do like to try and ask everybody what don't you like and, and what don't we yeah. do? Because that's, that's when you really sort of get the gems and, and find out you know, what isn't being catered for. And again, the, the kit, seeing the new gear. I think people in the past have said there hasn't been enough retail there. Well, I know that several retailers are going to be there this year. I know that Crack yeah. Shop, we've already mentioned, um, will have a stand there. Um, back to sort of the, the trade side of things, obviously Tony Beal has told us a few weeks ago that there's going to be some great things to see on the day state. BRK and MTC stand. Um, the Airgun Target Company, I was speaking with Tom from the Airgun Target Company. They're going to be there and they've got at least one pretty exciting sounding new target that they're going to be unveiling there. And as you've already said, the night vision, the infrared, the thermal, there's, there's going to be some really exciting stuff. The Scott Country team have told me that their stand's going to have some amazing stuff on it. And you know, those guys are so knowledgeable, so friendly. Again, yeah. Go and have a look, pick stuff up, uh, talk to them, pick yeah. their brains because you know they, they they are the real experts and and that's that's what what the event is for. Moving on very quickly to the uh, uh, question and answer section, Rich, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah, and, and this this actually is a is a question from uh, Peter Dean, and it's it's actually personally quite relevant to me this one today, and I'll tell you why. So Peter's question is, what was your first air gun, and do you still have it? And my, and I'm going to go, you know, selfish here, whole cup of selfish. Go for it. I'm going to go first here because <laughs> my very, very first air rifle was a an ASI, oops, paratrooper. This one right here, and this was given to me or loaned to me by my by my uncle Trevor when I was about 10. Um, so it's an awful long time ago now. And my uncle Trevor passed away uh, beginning of last week. And he had this rifle back at his house and he knew that things weren't going quite well for him. So he said to me, look, you know, take, take my air rifles, look after them. And so I was reunited with my very first air rifle from, you know, 40 odd years ago. Uh, I did put it through the chrono. It's running a, a, a healthy three and a half foot pounds. So I think it's probably, yeah, <laughs> it's seen some use. But my, my very first air rifle, yeah, was my uh, ASI Paratrooper. I moved from there to a BSAS Water S, which looked great, but wasn't so fantastic as my mate's HW80, 
and I bought that off of him, and I still have that as well. But yeah, my first rifle was a um, was a little uh, a little clinker. How about you, Gordon? What was your first rifle? And I'm guessing it's not one of those ones behind you. No, no, mine was a BSA Meteor, um, and I had that, and then the next one was a BSA Mercury, which I started hunting with then. I used to go out with an uh -huh. old boy when I was, you know, about 12, uh, but yeah, BSA Meteor, loved it. Nice, nice. So, I haven't got you know, it. I've been trying to buy a BSA Mercury S. I've yeah. tried, I, I've been, I'm going through a process of collecting all the guns that I used to have as a kid or wanted as a kid but couldn't. And Mercury S is one of the outliers at the moment, so I'm still mm. hunting the, uh, the internet for one of those. <laughs> How about you, Matt? Well, I'm, I'm, I've got to say, I'm so so envious of you that, that you are still able to see and hold your, your first air gun because mine, like, like you, was given to me by, by an uncle who I, I idolised him as a child. And you know, anything he was into, I wanted to be into. And I used to tag along a lot and never got to shoot i just i was just happy just to be there um and one day he presented me with his old webley vulcan and that was my air gun to, to keep to take home and look after a little 22 caliber webley vulcan and I, I i just couldn't believe that i had my own air rifle um and yeah so so my uncle being kev hawker who sort of crops up occasionally uh in magazine articles and still helps me film the reviews for the air gun show but oh, okay. he yeah so he, he he is responsible for me you know get, getting into air, so he's got a lot to answer for he, he got me into air gun shooting um and, i mean it, it wasn't long before i felt a bit restrained with this little wobbly barreled brake barrel and i desperately wanted an hw 77 by the time i'd saved up enough money this was late 80s going into the early 90s then and by the time i'd saved up enough money i was seduced by the air arms tx 200 instead which was so that was you know going from a Webley Vulcan to a TX two hundred was was mind blowing. But sadly, uh, I didn't keep the Vulcan, and I'd, I'd give anything to to still have that gun now. But oh. you, of course, as as a youngster, you don't realise the sentimental value that something will have later on later on in life. But uh, no, that that was my first air gun. And if, if, of all the guns that you've had in the past, you know, to both of you, which one would you go back in time and and have back and not let go. For me, it would definitely be that Vulcan. I, I'm not. I'm not too sentimental about guns, to be quite honest with you. And I tend to be very much like it's. It's a. It's a tool. It does a job. Um, I, I want what should be the best one for that requirement. Yeah. But that one being my first one, and the, the fact that my uncle was kind enough to give it to me, and I think I then went on and oh, exchanged it for something, or just yeah, just treated it like a trading chip rather than the. the the amazing thing that it had, it had been for him, you know, that gesture uh, of him to, to give it to me. What, what about you, Gordon? Yeah. If you could go back and get one one air gun back that you parted with, I'm not amazed you here. Um, it would definitely be my BSA Super Ten. Oh, really? I had the best times with that at the time. I had a massive farm at permission, um, and. Wherever you pointed that gun, it's whatever you aimed at, it seemed to hit. Yeah, and I sold that and my Rapid Seven for a deposit on my first house. Oh well, yeah, yeah that's that's that's, but, that's fair. That's that's yeah. yeah. Is that acceptable, Matt? I, I think I think that that's that's you know a deposit for a house is a pretty pretty strong lever, isn't it? I'd have kept the Rapid Seven and bought the tent if it was me, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, mm. It's amazing to me because uh, I've collected quite a few Springers from from my youth, and you know they're all lovely. Don't get me wrong, but it makes you realise just how far air gun technology has moved forward. And I'm not talking just more Springers. You know, the quality of triggers and everything has just improved. I wouldn't say always that build quality um has um is as good nowadays on some guns as it is on on older guns they all seem to be made really well even if they were made to a lower standard of, of performance but um <clears throat> they're still lovely things to have around anyway mm. right i have a guys i have a second question for you uh from dave fry and i know that you you both do a, you know lots of hunting so 
if I had to kind of twist your arm behind your back, what would you give up first? Would it be your shooting sticks or would it be your thermal spotter? What would you want to keep and what would you have to give away if you had to give away one of them? I'd give away the shooting yeah. sticks all day long. Then thermal spotters are an absolute game changer. And you'd have to prize mine out of my cold, dead fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm with you. What about you, Matt? Um, it's a really difficult one for me, actually, because I really lean on both of those things frequently. Uh, funny enough, though, if, you, if you'd have asked me two or three years ago about a thermal spotter, I'd have said, what's all the fuss about? That's, a, that's an expensive luxury. You don't need it. Uh, nowadays, well, firstly, they've become more affordable. Secondly, the quality for what you get now for less money is amazing. Yeah. And thirdly, yeah. I couldn't imagine going shooting at night now and not having a, a low magnification, wide field of view, looking for heat signatures. However, my shooting sticks have become such a crutch um, to, to the detriment of my real shooting technique that I reckon I would probably yeah. still part with my thermal spotter and keep my sticks just so I can hit stuff when I really? spot it either with my eyes or through some binoculars. Good job it's a, it's a hypothetical question and not a real one, isn't it? Because, a yeah, exactly. I exactly. Think, I don't think I could do without either, to be honest. I think, I, I think I'd probably side with you, Gordon, in as much as you, know, you can always or you can usually rest on something else. Mm. But... You know, thermal spot, I think I'd be lost. I, I, funny enough, I, like you, Matt, I didn't really come across them until a few years ago when I re had to review a bunch for the magazine. And I got four of these thermal spotters, whatever they are, through to review. I took them down on one of my rat permissions, switched on the first one, which is actually a, a Pulsar product that I've got now. And I thought, oh my God, it's like wearing x ray spectacles at night. It's just unbelievable. You know, the, the only I think the only time I would, I could I could possibly give up my thermal is if I was rat shooting in a yard, and I was using the old night sight sit up and beg mm. screen IR product where you can sort of kind of scan around and look through the screen. But yeah, no, I I, I think they are they are easily my and, and Dave's question is a good one because you know, to my sense they are the two most most important pieces of kit that I carry with me other than my rifle. I was amazed when um, I got, I, I just got the thermal and I went round to my permission and I knew, obviously, I knew there was rabbits on there and it was a case of just looking around and picking up, you know, whatever. But when I went in with that thermal, it was like a rabbit party. It was like, which one do I shoot first? I could not believe it. Have you guys used thermal scopes much? No. And I'd be interested in what your thoughts are on on them. I, Matt, I have a I bit, you, and I've you, not been blown away because I – personally for me, I think the, the ideal setup, if, if money is no object, you want a, a thermal spotter, as I've just said, lowest magnification you can get it on, so you've got a really wide yeah. field of view, and you're just quickly skimming around looking for a heat signature, which you know you won't miss because it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. At that point, really, identification isn't important because you can tell by where something is and what it's moving like. You know, you're not, you're not shooting at it anyway. So you, you've been alerted to where something is. Then yeah. I like to go over to the infrared, which has given me a lot more detail and, and depth. And I can see much more of what's around the target. So obviously then you're getting clear target identification. You're getting a, a clear idea of the background. And you've got that degree of precision because I know you've said to me in the past, and I would quite agree that with some, certainly the more affordable thermal uh, rifle scopes, sometimes you can't tell one end mm. of a rat from the other. Uh, and that, that's just no yeah. good. Uh, and there are times, I know you had a close call once with a, with a goat, didn't you, through, through a very blobby yeah. thermal. God. I, 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 was, I was actually reviewing a, a, a really good quality um, thermal scope. I think it was a Pulsar. And I was on a rat permission that kept goats. And I kind of saw this rat halfway up a wall through the thermal on the on the scope and i thought that's a rat it's rat shaped and i'm kind of lining up on it and i wasn't quite sure and thank god i wasn't because i, I put my my torch on and this rat turned out to be a, a goat's muzzle just poking through a hole in the wall and it looked rat shaped you know mm. and thankfully obviously i didn't 
shoot my one of my permission owner's scopes in the face with an air rifle. That would have been awful. So and I think the other thing with thermal scopes is, um, you know, and you, you guys know, through a spotter, you'll see something and it will be a clear image. Yes, that's definitely a rabbit. It's 30 yards away, no trouble. And then when you go to look through your IR scope, it's actually sat behind grass and twigs and, and a bush and what have you. Yeah. And the shot's not on. Now, with a thermal scope, you're going to think that's a clear shot, and, you know, and it's not. Um, on the other hand, conversely, I think you know, I've tried IR spotters before, um, and you know, they, they, they haven't been great. You know, they're, they're better than nothing. But you know, I remember going out once with a, an IR spotter and a thermal spotter, and looking with the IR spotter around the field and you know, not really seeing anything. And then going with the thermal, and there's five or six rabbits that all happen to be facing, you know, backside towards me, so I couldn't see any eye shine through the through the infrared. So that really made me realise, as you say, Matt, thermal for spotting, IR for shooting. I've uh, got a question from Mike Davis, and very simply, bullpup or rifle? What do you prefer, hmm. Gordon? You want to kick us off with that one? Bullpup or rifle? Uh, oh, that's so hard. Um, I'm going to have to say ball pup now. Really? Uh, for right. the simple reason. Well, like the Wolf of Rain, it's light, very carry, you know, carryable. But um, yeah, I, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think I'll have to say ball pup. I really do. I mean, I love my, I love all guns, I love my rifles, but I think for ease of use in the field, um, definitely a bullpup. Definitely a bullpup. There you go. There you go. Rich? I, I'm going to kind of fudge a little bit because I would say some bullpups um, I really like. Um, generally speaking, I don't, I don't like them that much because some of them just seem kind of heavy for the size and they're they're quite tall as well, or they seem quite tall. Um, but having said that, you know, one of my absolute favourite go-to rifles right now is the BRK Ghost, and I've got mm. the carbine version of that. And it's just nice and compact, and you can get a scope low to the to the barrel. It's what I've been shooting all of these uh, these feral pigeons with. Um, yeah, and that's obviously an out and up bullpup. I have a couple of uh, of FX impacts as well. And I shoot uh, in FAC, and I shoot an awful lot of rabbits with them because they're nice and compact, and again, they're not too tall. Um, but you know, like you, Gordon, I still love my rifles. I'm a sucker for a nice piece of walnut, you know. And I don't think I could ever give up my my R12 and my Wolverine R. But I think, generally speaking, I like most rifles. Generally speaking, I like a lot of bullpups. But not all of them. I'd be inclined to agree with you, Richmond. I, I was actually pretty late to the ballpark party because, um, again, I, I, I like traditional styling. I like a rifle to look like a rifle, like a, look like a sporting rifle. And I was probably just being a bit of a luddite, to be honest with you. But the, the first ballpark to win me over properly was the FX Impact Mark II, and I just started to get it yeah. with that. It was compact. I liked the way it handled, um, and then as you've just said more recently sort of naming the same names it's the, the, the brk ghost it is a fantastic ballpup but in my heart of hearts if i had to only have one it would be a rifle because a lot of the, the shooting that i do the pest control that i do is is such close range that i do like to have the scope down really flat to the barrel and i'm also yeah. a devil for canting a gun as well and when i feel like i've got sort of three or four inches between the scope and the barrel and that can't been a problem or a rat comes out seven or eight meters away and you've got to give it a massive hold under and the, uh, rather hold over and there's so much margin for error that 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 frustrates me a little bit so i i'm warming to the, the practicalities of ball pups and, and seeing that but at the moment i still like the sort of handsome looks of a walnut stocked rifle and the fact that i can get the scope dead low on it um mm. mo moving on very quickly to the next question. Now, I know that Terry and Dave actually had this question uh, in, the, in the previous podcast, but Rich, I want to put it again because it's been asked by somebody else anonymously. It must be asking for a friend. Um, 
But I know you you are absolute mustard on this one. So, so the, the question is, I can't get a shooting permission. Can you give me some tips? Now, Rich is good at this to the point of being really annoying because whenever I speak with him, he's just been to look at a new permission. Whenever I complain that there aren't many rabbits on my ground, he's telling me he's got yet another permission where he's tripping over rabbits. So, Rich, what's, what's your top tip or tips? fairly quickly for acquiring shooting permissions? I would say uh, horse owners. Um, yeah, horse owners are, I think, the people who are most worried about the loss of livestock. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a chicken farmer might be worried about losing a few eggs to rats. You know, a crop farmer obviously is concerned about crop damage by, by, uh, by, by rabbits. But, you know, if you see a Ten thousand pound racehorse put a foot down a, a rabbit hole, you know that that leaves them up. Now, one thing I would say is I I I've got a couple of paddock um, uh, permission owners, and they were and they're new ones, and they were so grateful every time I went shooting, like really grateful. It made me think, hang on a second, you know there must be other people like that. And I I live in Berkshire, and I put a message. I found the Berkshire horse and pony owners page or something. And I just put a message on there and said, hi, you know, um, if you have a problem with, with rabbits or, or rats or squirrels or pigeons, you know, I'd be happy to help. I've got this many years experience. I'm fully insured. Um, you know, if I can help, please let me know. And I just went to bed that night and I thought no one was ever going to answer that. Woke up in the morning. I had eight people, eight messages saying, oh, God, yes, please. Please come down. Give me a call. I'm inundated, inundated with rats and rabbits and everything. And some of them didn't pan out, but I picked up probably three or four permissions off the back of that one message. Um, and I think that all kind of boils down to um, pick on people who have a genuine um, issue with pests. And then you know, all the other you know, well-mentioned well points about turning up smart, um, being presentable, turning up on time, um, asking all the right questions. I always ask about you know, public right-of-way, public access boundaries all that kind of stuff that all helps but unless someone has a problem then you know you're going to be barking up the tree and i always offer to the landowner if they would like to come out with me mm. for the first few times they're more than welcome to or if they have a you know a son or a daughter who's potentially interested they can come up they never say yes because they've got a million other things to do yeah but you know it's all about it's all about thinking what are the barriers that i would have up if i was being asked by a stranger, can I come on your land with a gun at night and shoot, please? Mm -hmm. And I think about what are the things I can do to knock those down before we even kind of get to the nitty gritty. So uh, I would say pick on horse horse owners, paddocks owners, mm. first and foremost. What, what about you, Develop Gordon? Anything to add to that well. in terms of acquiring shooting permissions and, and you're asking and getting getting the right answer? Well, just what I mean, like Richard, I mean, one of my permissions came from I was having my car in OT and I was chatting to the guys there and I said, do you know anyone with any land? And they said, yeah, us, we've got horses. I said, would it be okay to come and shoot? And they went, yeah, fabulous. And it's literally just asking people. Yeah, not being yeah. afraid to ask, not being afraid by you know, knockbacks and being polite when you get knockbacks. And I always say to people, if you ask 50 people and 49 of you knock you back, but one says yes. You have succeeded. And for me also, exactly. there's another route to take. And it's one of the best routes is not to ask. So think of anybody that you know who's either got some land or knows somebody that's got some land. So you're not going to a complete stranger and say to that friend, I've noticed you've got a problem with rabbits or your mate who's got some woods. It's crawling with squirrels. Would they like me to help thin them out? And I think that way, you're, you're offering, not asking. Um, and also the rejection, then they're saying, no, I'm all right, thanks. So I think for them, it's, 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 it's easier because it's not that, can, can I come and shoot on your grain, which is just always a bit of a tricky one. But I think yeah. it, there's, never, there's never a straightforward answer to acquiring permissions. I think so many people manage to do it in different ways. And as, as Terry mentioned previously, when you've got a permission, look after it, do a good job, be polite, because word of mouth will get you more than likely other permissions. Um, but it's, it's just cracking that, that first one. It's also important to recognize that 
know, you are potentially solving a genuine problem for these people. So, you know, don't go in thinking that, you know, you're asking for a favor. You know, you, you, you have a free service that you can offer that potentially will solve a problem for them. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. you know, never lose sight of that fact. And I, th- and I think also something we've talked about before is being insured. Ha- having some insurance, yeah. um, I think I- I've approached a lot of landowners that probably have never even heard of shooting insurance, but when they hear that you are an insured shooter, they think, oh, right, you must take this seriously. Yeah. And it's just that other le- another layer of almost professionalism, if you like, the fact that you're not just looking for somewhere to, to bumble around, um, you know, you-, you-, you take your sport seriously. Like, we're moving along now. We're getting getting close to the end. Gordon, um, quick quick question for you. So we've talked about our sort of cherished old air guns and air guns we might like to get back. But any air gun in the world, whether you've owned it or haven't owned it before, your desert island air gun. It, it you you can have electricity if you need it, and you can have a compressor on on your desert island. But if you could pick any air gun in the world, only one, what would it be? That would definitely have to go to my Air Arms S510 tactical. Right. She is an absolute tack driver. And it, she's just choice. beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, you're, you're, a lucky, you're a lucky man. You, so you, you, you have your Desert Island Air Gun. Mm. <laughs> You've already got it. Right. Well, I just want to wrap up by reminding uh, viewers and listeners to pick up a copy of Air Gun World magazine. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, it's a really bright one, so you, you won't miss this. Or uh, better still, take out a subscription. You can get 13 copies a year delivered to your door. Now, we've actually got a subscription offer for podcast listeners with a 15% discount. So if you go to airgunshooting.co.uk and the discount code is AGWPOD24, we will also put the details in the description for this episode. Also, thanks again to Crackshot, the podcast sponsor. Now, they're based in Newton Abbott, so should you find yourself in Devon, do drop in and take a look. They're a really friendly bunch, or you can find them online at crackshot.uk. Um, and I just want to say thanks for tuning in. Rich, thank you. Gordon, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be back, Rich and I, in four weeks. And Dave and Terry will be back with another guest in two weeks' time. Thank you.